Uh, but with that, we also do have one last special guest speaker today, Pastor Steve Chang from Living Hope Community Church, uh, someone who is very near and dear to my own heart, who's served as a mentor figure in a lot of ways to me as a young pastor. Um, and Pastor Steve is probably the hardest working pastor that, that I know. Uh, and he's probably one of the most visionary pastors that I know. But uh, regardless of how you know, large his church is, regardless of how he has led movements and built networks, and he's a pastor to other pastors, uh, the thing that has really, really moved my heart the most and the thing that I most appreciate about Pastor Steve is just how much he loves his church family. I remember having the opportunity to go and visit Living Hope for a Sunday service. Uh, And mind you, they they have like a thousand people (laughs) at their church. It's way bigger than us here at Homes Family Chapel. And in the sea of thousands of people, a thousand people, uh, I remember seeing Pastor Steve uh, walk up to these, you know, little three, four-year-old toddlers and calling them by name. I don't don't remember their names. He he remembers their names, but I don't remember their names. He's like, hey, John, hey, Susan, hey, Sally. I, I don't know if that's their real names or not. But I remember him saying hi to these little toddlers. And I remember feeling so convicted in that moment and and praying, God, I don't know if OMC Family Chapel will ever grow to to the size of Living Hope, but whether we are big or small, help me to be that kind of pastor, the kind of pastor who knows people by name, who knows children by name. And Pastor Steve is that kind of pastor. Even though he's so visionary, even though he leads other pastors and movements and networks, at heart, he is a pastor who loves God's people. And so I'm really thankful that he's here to share God's word with us. Again, Pastor Steve serves as the founding and senior pastor over at Living Hope Community Church. He's married to his wife, Hannah. He's father to his two girls. And he's also a very proud grandfather now. And uh, maybe most importantly, he's a very proud alumni of the greatest school on the planet, UCLA. Right? So let, let's welcome him up as he comes to share God's word. Let's give him a warm welcome as he comes to share God's word with us today. Five reasons why I love OMC Family Chapel. Number one, sometime in the early 80s, my mom asked me while I was a student at UCLA to come visit a church with her on Western Avenue. And I came not knowing where I was going, but I arrived at the strange place that used to be Ralph's Market. And so uh, some of you have been coming here for a while, but I'm confident and I probably visited OMC long before many of you did. The second reason why I love OMC Family Chapel is because it is one of the few churches that I recommend to students who from our church who are going to UCLA Um, and as Pastor Josh said UCLA is a great school Um, their football team is 5-0 and 8-0 when we go back to last year with a convincing win over USC, mind you. But, to, but just to be fair, one of my friends used to say that if you want to get a good education, go to UCLA. But if you want to make a lot of money, go to USC. So I don't know what's better. But if you look at your own pastors, you kind of realize that's probably true because they got a great education, but they're working here at the church. Same here, come on. The third reason why I love OMC Family Chapel uh, is because when uh, Pastor Daniel Lee was finishing up his internship from Living Hope, I recommend that you should uh, perhaps check out OMC Family Chapel and work with Pastor Josh. I believed in Josh and I thought that they would be a good combination and I'm so grateful for the work that Daniel is doing. Uh, But um, when we sent Daniel uh, to OMC Family Chapel, and I was after he signed all the paper. I was asking Josh, "Hey, one thing, Pastor Josh, um, do you have a New Year's Eve service and celebration? And if not, can we borrow Daniel for New Year's Eve? That's an unusual request." But when Daniel was an intern at Living Hope, at one time we sent the interns on an outing. You guys can do whatever you want. They said, "Can we go to dinner? And then can we go to Norebang?" karaoke and I asked them how it went and they said that they went crazy that Daniel really tore it up on karaoke so much so that that year on New Year's Eve we had um, a celebration and we did a masked singer competition literally a masked singer where people uh, anonymously put on uh, costumes and they sang and there were judges and it was 
uh, the biggest hit that we've had in a New Year's Eve. If you've never gone to a karaoke with Pastor Daniel, you need to go. Um, fourth reason why I love OMC Family Chapel is my appreciation for Pastor Josh. He is a person that I respect uh, greatly. I remember when there was a time a bunch of years ago, um, Steve Bang Lee and I, he was at our church at that time, we were looking for a full-time associate pastor, and we said, hey, Josh would be the right person for us. And, and we were looking for someone who is not only gifted, and faithful, but someone just a person of character. So I remember sitting down with Josh, and I don't know if Josh knew why we were meeting, but I said, hey, can you come to Roland Heights? We met at a Thai food um, uh, place, and I asked him, would you consider uh, coming to Living Hope to work uh, with me uh, full-time? And I believe at that time you were part-time here at this church, and uh, he prayed about it, and he chose you over Living Hope. He turned me down twice. I want you to know that's how much he loves OMC Family Chapel. We're in a small group together, and um, we meet once a month uh, with other senior pastors, and I'm so grateful for his heart and his insight into uh, this next generation. Uh, the fifth and final reason why I really appreciate OMC Family Chapel is this. Uh, periodically, I teach at Talbot Seminary. I teach people who are going to be pastors. And the topic that I teach on in that one lecture is how to minister in an Asian American uh, immigrant church context is in particular. And one of the things I talk about is how uh, when in the immigrant church, especially the English-speaking side, there's a dissonance uh, as opposed to a harmony. And the example, one of the examples that I use is OMC Family Chapel. Mind you this, that OMC Family Chapel is an English-speaking congregation uh, that works with a Korean-speaking congregation that is located in Los Angeles, um, in which the primary ethnic group is actually Hispanic, and, you, and the church is located on Western Avenue. And the name of the Korean church is Oriental Mission Church. Hey, you want to come to church with me? What's the name of your church? OMC. What does OMC stand for? Oh, Mission Church. <laughs> no, what is it? Oh, you know, it's funny, 30 years ago, that wasn't bad. Occidental College aged well. Oriental didn't. Someone says to you, you go to Oriental Church? I'm offended. That seems racist. Oh, yeah, that's the name of our church. By the way, for those that don't speak Korean or those who are not Korean, Oriental Mission Church in Korean sounds much cooler. But it does beg a question. What am I doing here? Why am, I at a, why am I at a church called Oriental Mission Church Family Chapel? Who am I and why am I here? At your 31st anniversary service, I want to help answer that particular question. And I believe embedded in your uh, name, because when you, people do ask, what church do you go to? When you tell your parents, I landed at this church, you'll say, OMC, Family Chapel. Chapel is a sanctuary, a space, a place of worship. It's a location that is oftentimes associated with an institution or a home. It's a place that's set aside for worship. And it's family. With all the ebb and flow of what it means to be a spiritual family. So if you have not done so yet, could you open your Bibles or fl uh, flip open your um, app to 1 Corinthians chapter 12? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to try to help answer the question of why you are here and who you are. The Bible oftentimes uses different analogies to talk about the church. And as we are looking at Family Chapel's 31st anniversary or 31st birthday, who are we? Who are you? And I believe it gives us four answers. The first is this. You are different. You are 
different. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6, and verse 13. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. Verse 13, for by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. The idea is that there are differences among its members. They are different in giftedness. They are different in roles. They are different in impact. They are different in ethnicities. They are different in uh, socioeconomic statuses and more. And what the author is trying to say to all of us is that your differences are not accidental, but it is by design. Verses 7 and 8. For each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. The word to note is given. Your differences were given to you. The thing that makes you perhaps feel different from all the others in this space, in this church, is not an accident, but a gift. Um, If you came in today, you received a puzzle piece. Can you take it out for me? Take a close look at it. Try to figure out what it represents. And, you you know, you can stare at your neighbors, and uh, it's probably different uh, color and and the drawings and, and the such, but one of the things that is true of each one of your pieces is this. Your puzzle piece is unique, meaning there are no two pieces in the space or from the box that are identically the same. I, I remember my uh, older daughter, as uh, she's growing, uh, when she was growing older, she would love uh, doing jigsaw puzzles. And we would set it up in the garage, and, and it started in like, you know, with the smaller uh, uh, puzzles, with 100 pieces, and then it grew to the 500 to 1,000, and, and she would be intense and focused, and it would be one of our, her favorite daddy-daughter kind of activity to sit there and intensely knock out a project. Your piece, one of the things I learned is uniquely different. There's no two pieces that are alike. And the manufacturer, when they, when they printed it and cut the piece, made sure that each piece is unique. You know, there are times when you come into a church community, the thing that stands out the most to us emotionally is how different we are from other people. I'm too old, I'm too young. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, this is where I grew up. Uh, I'm not from this area. I'm from far away. Oh, I, I, I don't go to UCLA, USC. I go to a different college. I am uh, too quiet. I'm too loud. I am not Korean. I'm too Korean. In fact, I'm barely understanding what's going on here. And sometimes what we do is we take our differences and make it a liability, but I want to say to you that your difference may be the greatest asset that you have to offer to this church. That those who are married and busy raising kids, that might be your greatest asset. That if you are a young college student, broke, but just have a lot of time, maybe that's what you can offer and stored it well, I would ask. You know, a, f- a couple of months ago, uh, we had our new members uh, introduction. 
And um, Pastor Daniel was here at Living Hope for a year, so he's seen many of that. We, those, we have it every three months or so. And this time we had a group of new members and they would normally be introduced by one of our deacons and the, de- the deacon would introduce each new member with a little bit of a bio of this person uh, comes from, uh, you know, from this school or is doing this or what he loves or she loves about Living Hope and how she's grown and what she aspires to do is something Uh, memorable about that person and something that we can learn to appreciate. This one Sunday, the deacon who was supposed to do the uh, new member's uh, introduction uh, couldn't make it, and so he asked one of the uh, person who was helping with that ministry to take over for him. And so this person, Jonathan, that's you, if you, if you happen to be watching this, Jonathan, he's a Korean American. He's um, uh, married with kids. He's, a, I think, a school teacher. He's a good guy, but he, 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 you know, he talks like he grew up in the hood a little bit. If you get what I mean, right? And apparently, he asked the pastor, our associate pastor in charge, "Hey, uh, I'd love to, you know, I'm, I'm going to do the introduction. Can they lay down some beats for me?" Okay. And so he apparently gave the AV team some tracks or beats. He said, we'll just play this one and then play this one. And so uh, I was told at the huddle, the prayer time before the worship service to the glory of God, that, that, that this uh, person was going to do the introduction and there were supposed to be some beats. I interpreted that as, oh, we're going to have some background music as they walk up. Well, what happened was something quite different. That he got up with the mic and he started strutting around. He started rapping. He rapped each person's introduction. You know, he's married to so-and-so. She's going so-and-so. And and the young people were just going nuts during service. Some of the older people were like, what is going on? Uh, It got a little bit, and we had a guest speaker, by the way, so it was very interesting, Um, and they were loving it. Um, It it got so interesting that uh, at the the second service, uh, the the, the new member, this is now his second time being introduced, he got so excited, he started... um, he, he did one of those things. You've ever seen the commercial, like they, they, or uh, some people, like they pretend like they trip and they start twerking? This is in the middle of a worship service. I had a guy twerking in my worship service. Um, you know, like my, my guest speakers were all laughing, and, and I don't know if they were laughing at me. Go, oh my gosh, you're going to have to clean that up somehow. But. Uh, and, um, but I, I thought it was just hilarious. I got up and said, I appreciate all of that, but we're just not going to do that again, okay? No, no, no more twerking on service. Uh, of course, I got an email from one of my elders and some other commu- feedback. Uh, young people loved it, and, uh, but the older people couldn't figure out what uh, they ought to make of it. Uh, by the way, the resolution is next time we're going to do new uh, members' introduction. We'll do it after the closing prayer. So if it gets out of control, we can say at least it wasn't worship, you know, something like that. You know what I appreciate, though? I appreciate the fact that uh, Jonathan is so different from me. I would never do that. I I couldn't even think of doing that. I don't have rhythm. Even if I wanted to and thought it was cool, I couldn't do that. I appreciate the fact that God made different people different. And so what sometimes people think is, I, I, I don't know if I fit in, is exactly the gift that you are bringing to the family. You are different. Secondly, you are incomplete. You are incomplete. Verses 12 and 13. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For the body is not one member, but many. Now, so uh, this is what the overriding kind of uh, picture that is drawn for us, that uh, the body or the church or the puzzle is one, 
but it is comprised of many different members or pieces. And it is only when you put the pieces together that you can draw that one picture. That no matter how perfect your pieces, you hold in your hand a puzzle piece, and the manufacturer designed it precisely as the, uh, he wanted or she wanted it to be designed. And even if your picture, uh, your piece is perfect, it alone cannot complete the picture. Pastor Josh, as much as we appreciate, respect him as a pastor, a husband, a father, um, and his giftedness, he alone cannot paint the full picture, that he needs other people to uh, play their roles, uh, minister their giftedness. We can make the mistake of thinking that, well, if only uh, we can have more of Pastor Josh's or Pastor Daniel's, um, but the truth of the matter is, God said, no, uh, they have their roles and you need to play your roles to paint that perfect picture. And what this does is if we understand this, it will help us. It would help us to know that no matter how gifted, how involved we are, we uh, can't do it all. And also, no matter how much you think and you're tempted to think that I don't matter as much, that the church needs you. You know, oftentimes this culture tells you is you're good enough and you don't need anyone else, but that is not necessarily true. Although you are beautiful on your own, the full picture can only be drawn when you're connected to others. So uh, what does it mean to be you at this church at this moment in time? First of all, God tells you that you are different, and if you feel different, good. That's the gift you are bringing. It tells us you are incomplete, that no matter how great you may be, that even if you're spirit-filled and really, really gifted, you cannot do it all yourself. The third thing that we should realize is you are necessary. You are necessary. Verses 15 through 17, it is a drama. It's a Korean drama that's happening in this church. The foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body. It is not for this reason, any the less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason, any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole um, were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? In verse 21, um, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, uh, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. It's a bit comical. It is, it is a Korean drama, really. The foot in, is insecure. Oh, man, I, I really want to be a hand. And the ear is always comparing herself to the eye. No one ever looks at me. All covered up. And, and the nose was trying to keep out of all the drama, and the narrator brings him up and, and points to the nose. And the two uh, uh, supposedly ones who are more visible, the eye and uh, the ear, oh, no, the, the eye and the hand, are talking about, well, who is needed more God says to us in verses 22 through 24, on the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our unseemly members come to have more abundant seemliness. Whereas our seemly members have no need of it, but God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked. He's saying there are uh, certain members of the body or certain giftedness, certain personalities that, humanly speaking, 
seem more necessary or important or strategic. And there are others which seem unnecessary are less important. Have you ever thought about the fact that we spend a lot of time, energy, emotion, and money on parts of our body which are actually not that important? For example, have you ever thought that we spend way too much time shampooing, conditioning, curling, cutting, perming, lightening, mousing, gelling, combing, brushing our hair? And yet, I have yet to meet a family member who would come and, and, and tell me, Pastor Steve, can you pray for me? My husband is dying of acute baldness. Right? But it's interesting that we spend so much of our effort in trying to make beautiful a, a very visible part of our, uh, our body, which is our hair, but that which is much more critical to our health, our vital organs, our liver, our kidney, and even our hearts, we don't pay as much attention to. You know, it, it is easy for a church to give greater attention to those with outward, showy gifts, whether it be the gift of preaching, the gift of music, and there are some who have a big personalities and uh, they get a lot of attention, but those who are quieter, and have gifts that may not be as external, the gift of mercy, the gift of service, the gift of faith, that humanly speaking, we do not give as much honor to, nor do we give much attention to. I know that, um, uh, there, there, at least in my church, Living Hope, there are people with uh, outstanding external gifts. But I also know and I've come to realize over the years that, that those with the quiet gifts, personalities, are oftentimes more necessary. About six months ago, um, a new couple started attending our church, uh, Tony and Kim, and um, they're non-Asian. They're probably in their 60s or 70s. They come from a, a mobile home uh, park r right up the street from our church. Uh, they found our church because one of their neighbors who was in her 90s used to come, loved our church, and she passed away. I met them at the funeral, and they would say that um, their neighbor, Aveline, used to talk about the church all the time, and after the funeral, they decided to come check it out and they've loved our church. And it is, they're not members yet, but um, I know them and I, 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 I'm reminded of them because on Sundays they come to the 9.30 service, they, they sit like on the second row in the front middle almost every week. It's, no one told them in an Asian American church, you don't sit in the front, that you're supposed to sit as far away from the senior pastor as possible so that, 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 that you don't make eye contact with them, right? Um, they, they come, they sit in the fr uh, front, and, um, you know, and after service, um, you know, after the closing prayer, they're the first ones there. And Pastor, well, you really spoke to us. I, well, that's what I was thinking exactly. Oh, Pastor, um, they told me, oh, can you pray for me? I, I think I might have to go get this procedure done, etc. And, and a few weeks later, I would ask them, Pastor, you're, you're one of the best pastors. You remember us, even in the midst of this big church, and you, you're telling, you're, uh, you're asking about us when I'm not there, we're not there. It's, you know why I remember them? Because they're the, they're the ones sitting in the front <laughs> and, and telling me, you know, the, the little things that they appreciated about the message and the such. I don't know what giftedness they have. I don't know. Um, what they'll bring to the table once they become members. Uh, they told me last Sunday, oh, we have this new neighbor in our um, mobile home park, and uh, I told them, we told them about, uh, about this church, and uh, they're going to invite him, uh, and then I told them about you, Pastor Steve, and such. You know, as a preacher, and Josh and Daniel, you know, like even in the midst, even in the space like this, uh, I'm going to tell you a secret, okay? Listen carefully. Okay, 
pastors are so insecure that when we preach, we're, we're like eager to see if anyone's actually looking and paying attention. And we're looking, the, we're scanning the room, we're scanning the room, okay, that person's looking, okay, good. At least one person's paying attention. They might be daydreaming, but at least the eyes are here. And we were taught, were you guys taught that? Scan the room and find like at least four people or so, and you just go going back and forth, back and forth, upstairs, down, you know, things like that. Um, uh, Tony and Kim, boy, they're my go-to people now. <laughs> one time after service, they asked, Pastor, you know what you said then? It was so good, I wanted to respond verbally. Is that allowed at this church? I said, please, please do. Yeah, it's not only allowed, but we want you to. Everyone else is just kind of not doing it. We, right? uh, oftentimes, it is not the show we get. It is not uh, the official gifts or the positions. But you'd be surprised how the quiet de um, demeanor of this just a servant heart can make such a profound difference. I can tell you people who uh, have told me afterwards, oh, I met so-and-so, and they showed me to my seat, and they talked with me afterwards. So if you sometimes feel like you are tempted to be a beautiful set of hair, and you're wondering, why can't I be more fully hairful? Perhaps God didn't call you to be hair, but, one, but God called you to be liver, and you just need to relish and be grateful for that. Fourthly, fourth thing, not only are you um, different, not only are you uh, incomplete, and not only are you uh, necessary, but you are connected. You are connected. Verses 25 and 26, God assumes something, that there should be no division in the body, that, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So there's an assumption here that God is making that, uh, that the church is comprised of different members, but they're connected. And that if something happens to one of the members then others will feel its joys as well as its pains. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. What God wants us to know is this, that when we are a family, that the pains of others should naturally hurt us, and the joys of others should excite us. You know, there's a misconception in a lot of people that because we sometimes come on Sundays at our Sunday best, that other people are doing well, and that they are the only ones really struggling with depression, anxiety, loneliness, despair, brokenness, that they are the only ones who perhaps are struggling with certain sin and temptation, uh, that they are the only ones who come from a really terrible home situation. I've been a pastor a long time, and like Pastor Josh said, uh, our church, I've been there for 29 years now, and there was a point in time when my wife and I, we would counsel different people, get to know people, um, and we thought that a lot of people had problems, challenges, but, but there's some people that just, you know, don't. They have a really comfortable, good life. I remember there was this one family, and um, he was a Stanford grad doctor. She was a Berkeley grad. Uh, I, I forgot her occupation, but she, at that time, was uh, taking care of her kids. Both uh, just good-looking they, when they were up in the Bay Area, they not only were really involved at church, but they helped start a really vibrant ministry on campus. Uh, they, he, he was doing his res, residency not too far, or kind of far from the church, maybe about an hour away or so. But somehow they made it to church every week. 
Uh, when he couldn't, she would bring her kids. And uh, they were just like the model family. That instead of saying, oh, I, you know, I just had my baby, I can't come out, but she would just come and joyfully glad, and gladly serve. My wife and I thought, wow, that, now they are a perfect family. So, and there are people like that that don't, really need, don't really need others, but they are there to minister to others. I remember one time, though, um, they had their second child, and we visited them at the hospital. And um, as we would do when new babies are born, and we would go and pray for them. And when we went and visited this family, found out that they had a prayer request for the health of their second child. Um, so we went and prayed, and it was for them deep and personal. It wasn't public either. So we prayed, and on the way home, my, my wife and I realized no matter how perfect our lives may seem to other people, every single one of us have seasons when we are hurting, we are discouraged, that we feel horrible about ourselves, that we need someone to weep with us and rejoice with us. Your puzzle piece, bring it up again. Let me ask you a question. Um, how many pieces, how many other pieces will your piece be connected to? How many? Say aloud. Four, for most of you, four, right? Now, if you're in the very corner, you have two, and that's Pastor Josh, he has no friends, you know. He, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, sh I need to be more respectful. Four, right? And that's how these things are normally designed. You have one piece above you, one piece below you, and two pieces besides you. One to your right and one to your left. Now, uh, sometimes what we do is this, we come to church and say, well, Nobody knows what I am going through. People don't care what I am going through. I could be missing for months and no one really knows me. And in fact, what you may say is like, I, I look around, I don't know how many people are in this space. There are people here I don't know. How do we weep for those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice? The puzzle illustration, the metaphor gives us a clue. You are not called to be connected with every other piece in the picture. You are called to be connected, deeply connected, directly connected to, to two to four. So that when they are not doing well, when they hurt, it naturally just hurts you. When something great happens in their lives, you can't help but to rejoice with them. That if during the midst of COVID, if, if their parents are sick and you can't even get near them and they're so broken up and concerned, you naturally know about it and you are anguished with them. That you care so much about them that even though you may uh, still uh, be looking for Mr. Right that when she is engaged, you can naturally rejoice with her. That uh, you might be wanting to uh, get your dream job and, and or, or can't right now, but when your friend lands that, that dream job of his, you are genuinely glad for him and you can rejoice with him, And the reason being is you're connected, you've invested your life into that person or those people. You know, oftentimes you, can, you might be tempted to think, well, but people don't care about me. I don't know how to build community. And, and you know, let, let me give you just some practical tips. Um, not everyone will you be compatible with or will be interested or are ready or it may, they, they may lack capacity because they have other people. Find two to four people. Two to four people. 
and spend a little bit of time with them. Be intentional, invest. Go to a car of five people. And when you are eating, when you're breaking bread, when you are in the drive, share something of your heart. Hey man, I'm really struggling with feeling like I, I don't belong at my college. Everyone seems just so much smarter than me. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm so discouraged. And allow that person to speak into your heart and hopefully that person will open up a little bit. And if that person opens up a little bit, then you remember and next time you see them or, uh, or go out of your way go a week or two later, reach out to that person, DM or text and say, hey, how are you doing? And this is how I'm uh, wrestling with what, what I'm going through. Um, in college, when I was in college, one of my best friends and I, um, I, uh, I mean, he, he was a really good friend, but I thought he could have the potential to be one of my best friends, if that makes sense. And guys are different than, than women. I, 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 not, I don't know if I'm being chauvinistic or sexist, but guys are different. Guys don't kind of say, hey, will you be my best friend? We just kind of like, you know, like, hey, you're a jerk. Hey, you're a jerk. Okay. <laughs> and somehow, you go, hey. Um, I, had, I had my friend. Um, he was a good friend already. We did ministry together. I thought he could be one of my best friends for life. And um, what I did, I actually wrote him a letter. I wrote a letter, and we were roommates at that time. I put it in his drawer. And I, you know, like, hey, can we, you know, I don't know if I said, can we be best friends or anything like that. I, I don't think I would have said that, but I just think I wrote, like, what I appreciate about him and, and things of that nature. And he never said anything about the letter. I know he read it. Because, <laughs> cause I, you know, because I would check. <laughs> But I know that he received my letter, and he's one of my best friends. I was his best man. I asked him to be my best man, um, and we still keep in touch, although he lives halfway across the country now. Um, the Christian life is not a solo sport, but a team sport. You were designed and men so that when you weep, it breaks the heart of someone else in the church. And when someone else hurts, that's supposed to resonate with you. The author concludes at the end of verse 27, now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. There are times when we uh, rebel against our design, when we are arrogant, that we don't think we need other people, when we are selfish, that we don't want to, uh, to accommodate others, when we become so insecure about who we are, but Christ looks at us our pathetic, sinful, selfish sinners that we are, and we chose, he chose to give up his body. So that he climbed upon that cross to give his life and shed his blood for us so that in his eyes, you and I are valuable, necessary, that he loves us in that way. We don't need to be a better version of who we are. We, uh, what Christ does is he remakes us. He makes us new, accepted, and his, the work is all done. During the, first, the 31st anniversary of OMC Family Chapel, if you come here today and you ask yourself the question, do I belong and who am I? I, what I want to say to you is that if God has brought you here by his divine providence, that you are here by design. And when you feel different, it is that which you can bring to the body. That when you feel like I am invisible, that maybe people don't notice me, that's precisely what God values and honors. That when you think that, um, that, I, that people don't care about me, that precisely God is saying to you, you need to care about one or two or four others as well. Uh, the great theologian, Dr. Seuss, once said this, if you'd never been born, 
then what would you be? You might be a fish or a toad in a tree. You might be a doorknob or three baked potatoes. You might be a bag of hard green tomatoes. Or worse than all that, why, you might be a wasn't. A wasn't has no fun at all. No, he doesn't. A wasn't just isn't. He just isn't present. But you, you are you, and now isn't that pleasant? Today you are you, that is truer than true. There is no one alive who is youer than you. Shout loud, I am lucky to be what I am. Thank goodness I'm not just a clam or a ham, or a dusty old jar of sour gooseberry jam. I am what I am, that's a great thing to be. What is it that God wants you to bring is your authentic self. Just be the true version of who you are, one that God values and loves. I'm going to ask the band to come up at this time. And as they do so, can you look at your puzzle piece again? Can anyone guess what the, pic, the whole picture is? Anyone, anyone want, to, want to guess? What is it? Iron Man. Oh, good one. Do you have like a face or a shield or something? A hand or something like that? Okay. Good one. Um, This is the picture that we're going to show. So, MC Family Chapel, I want you to assemble. I know, I've been wanting to say that. Your picture alone can never paint the whole picture. But when you're connected to your neighbors, people that are different from you, you paint a great and beautiful picture. Can we do this right now as the background music is playing? Can you bow your heads and close your eyes? Would you bring your insecurities and your feeling of inadequacy and differences, feeling lost a little bit, bring them to the presence of the Lord? And would you right now Just pray softly, verbally, audibly. Thank Him for the way that He has made you different. And covenant with Him that you will celebrate it and you will be whom God has called you to be. Will you do that? About 40 seconds, would you do that? And and actually pray verbally, would you do that? Father, I thank you for each man and woman in this space. And we will confess that no single person is here today accidentally, but you have brought them sovereignly here. Whether they have been coming for years or this is their very first Sunday, that they are here for a reason. And Lord, I, I pray that whatever insecurities, pains, and hurts, that each one of us have brought, we lay them at your feet. Whatever uh, feelings of inadequacies or differences, we lay them at your feet and, and confess that perhaps all of those things are by design. Lord, would you speak into each person's heart and soul? Remind them that you care deeply for them, that you love them, that you've put them here for a reason. And there are others in this space that they are supposed to touch and weep with and rejoice with. By the blood of your uh, your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.